That's all the AR. Okay. This is good. This is a good way of discussion. I'm not a big fan of the whole lecture style of things. Uh, I think a conversation is more helpful. Gets us more into a point where we can start to really critically analyze together and actually make progress on these things. So I, I'm interested in mobile technologies, like, uh, okay. yeah, programming. I, I developed several mobile applications, and I so did several internships in uh, mobile companies. Okay. So yeah. So there is a lot of uh, good program analysis stuff going on in the mobile domain, looking at things like power consumption. Um, whether whether you're looking at mobile in the context of mobile devices like phones or something a bit more yeah uh, phones phones okay. in particular uh, that's, that's the, the, the dedication to, uh, to making it work yeah. we're waiting a little bit longer and hope that we need some more uh, some more folks I, you know, I, I was only expecting we got up to 11 listed at one point, and then we dropped down to 9. Uh, I mean, it looks like we might have, we might have better than that. Thank you, it's confusing. Yeah, you know, it's my first time actually teaching in Burnaby, really. Uh, well, I get to have this wonderful view while, while the rest of you have to stare at a really small screen. I might have to change my slide layout, actually. I, I thought I might have a more massive screen, like in a lot of the other rooms. So my fonts might be a little bit small. We'll see. We'll see. I'm not optimized for this display. So you're just really tempered by certain equipment. I guess. Is, is this common in Burnaby? I don't know. This is considered well equipped. <laughs> yeah, this is not bad. It's very like four classrooms. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good to know. <laughs> that's that's interesting. Okay. Um, how many do we have? Four, uh, eight. 11. We're back up to 11, and I know that we've got some folks missing still. All right. That's that's pretty good. Um, so I might actually have to change some of my scheduling stuff that I've got planned for other things. That works. More people is good. Um, all right. If anybody shows up, I just have to be embarrassed. Um, okay. So I assume based on the fact that, of course, web page is up here, that you are, in fact, all here for uh, program analysis and reliability for special topics and operating systems. I don't know why it's, uh, it's not my fault that it's listed that way. It's just the way it is. Um, the course webpage is listed, uh, linked to from my homepage, so it should be easy to get to. You, probably a lot of you have already visited, uh, visited the, the page. Um, we do have a mailing list. I haven't sent anything to it yet, but I encourage you to use it, discuss things. Everybody can read stuff that goes on there. Um, yeah, so in terms of things that are on the course web page, we do have a schedule that is up. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, but all of the slides um, will be posted here as well as projects. Your first project is already up, so you're already late. All of you are behind. Um, and we also have a bunch of papers here. And so these are tentative papers in different areas. Some, I haven't actually read all of them myself, but I skimmed through them to make sure that they cover the core techniques that I want you to learn. And so we'll be able to critically analyze these papers and you'll be able to learn the core techniques involved with them as you go through the course. Um, but, yeah, so all of you are going to be presenting these, and it's going to be on a first-come, first-served basis. So uh, we'll get to that. But you can see this list of papers here. If you're interested in presenting one of them during the uh, during the, the first half of the course, send me an email. Um, because if someone else wants the same paper as, as you, and they send me an email first, 
Okay. Which one is, is it... the shortest? <laughs> ah, some of them are long. Some of, some of them are up to 16 or 18 pages. Um, most are not. And for the ones that are 16 to 18 pages, I don't necessarily expect you to go through them in detail. Uh, well, we'll, we'll get to this. Let's, let's actually go through my, my planned introduction. Um, part of what I want everybody to, to get from this is an experience and understanding of how to read research papers. And when you read a research paper, if it's 18 pages long and you're reading it for a course, you don't read everything in detail. That's just not, not the right way to read the paper, necessarily. Okay. So, yeah, standard introductory slides, right? Oh. So, of course, web pages up there, schedule, policies, assignments, paper suggestions. Yeah, there, there's a list of papers. If you're interested in presenting a different paper that's still in these areas, feel free to make suggestions. The course is flexible. These are my suggestions for papers that are up there. I'll put up more suggestions later. But if you, if you want to come to me and say, hey, I'm interested in this area. I've got a paper I want to read and present. Let's make that happen. Um, oh. Lines don't show up either. That's nice. Very nice. Very small screen. Okay. So, why are you actually here? Well, ultimately, programs are really big and complex and difficult to reason about. We have this standard software development workflow, right? Where you've got uh, design, implementation, testing, and debugging, and maintenance. And this goes back and forth over itself, eating its own tail. And you might have interesting questions about software, like, well, is there some more efficient design that I could actually have? What is the cause of a bug? How can I actually find new bugs? Or how can I find security vulnerabilities? And these are just some of the questions that interest me in particular. You probably come to this having some of your own interests in mind. And that's perfectly OK. Um, I think that makes it more interesting, actually. The problem, however, is that we have this complex software. And it doesn't really work. Right? And figuring out how to make it work, figuring out how to make it behave the way you want to and behave efficiently isn't easy. In fact, it's pretty much impossible for a person to do. So as a result, we lose lots of money, people die, and all of you end up suffering as you try to make implementations of whatever research uh, you're actually doing, which is hard, right? Making research prototypes is still hard. So is there a better way? And if at all possible, it's nice if we can push these tedious, difficult tasks onto computers instead of having people do them. So that's kind of the underlying theme of the course. Take things that people are interested in, that they want to do in the software development lifecycle, and push the burden of those things onto computers. So we're going to try and learn how to do that. And the way we're going to do that is through a survey of these different program analysis techniques. So in general, program analysis is just a way of saying, OK, there is software out there. I want to start to analyze the structure of the software and the meaning of the software to do something interesting. That's it. And so we can look at things like profiling, where you're looking at the speed or efficient resource usage. Look at testing. So we might ask, how can I make my tests more effective so that they're more likely to detect failures? And you can even do things like bridge testing and verification, which I'll talk about in a moment. Debugging, so explaining or locating the actual causes of bugs. Concurrency, well, how can you explain some bug? How can you recognize potential concurrency in a program so that you can exploit it more easily? Um, things like security, how can you identify security vulnerabilities before they're exploited by hackers or to actually be the hacker and exploit security vulnerability? Um, and we can look at things like verification or how to prove certain properties about the behavior of programs. All of these things are interesting, and this is only a subset of what we could look at. Um, I actually plan to look at some papers from each of these topics. If there's another topic you're interested in, let me know. Okay, so that's kind of what we're going to look at. Another question that we want to have is, how are we going to look at it? What perspective do we want to keep in mind as we're looking at all of these papers, as we're doing this survey? So we want to keep these guiding questions in mind. And these are things like, what are the compromises made? Ultimately, almost every single interesting question you can ask about a program is technically impossible to answer in general. 
or to precisely answer in general. This is provable. It is a provable property of programmers. Does anybody remember why they have experience with that? Maybe? Programs NP complete. It's worse. NP complete is doable. NP hard. NP hard is still doable. It's just really, really expensive. It's actually provably impossible to answer most interesting questions about computer programs. And so we're going to look at the compromises that you have to make. How can you answer these questions in spite of the fact that it's technically impossible to do so? Which sounds really weird. But that's what makes this interesting. Understanding the compromises that you have to make when answering these questions is crucial to understanding what an effective program analysis is and how to make these things work in practice. So these are the sorts of things like what corner cases will make these analyses fail? Because if it's technically impossible to do in general, then maybe you'll just try to do it most of the time. Right? So when won't they work? What are the corner cases? And why do these corner cases exist? If you can choose which corner cases fail, then maybe you can push these boundaries around in a way that is pragmatically beneficial for you. We also want to look at how authors present their work and why. So this is where we're looking not just at the content of the individual papers, the things that we look at, but how to critically evaluate it, how to critically analyze it. So what do the, the authors highlight in the individual papers? What do they hide or not discuss that they clearly should have? So we're going to start reading between the lines in these papers to figure out what the authors are omitting and omitting maybe maybe deliberately, um, maybe just accidentally because they didn't think something through. And as a part of this, we're going to look at how all of these papers are evaluated. Oh, no lead over there. Dangerous. Um, so it's very, very common for research papers to be evaluated in such a way that makes them publishable and not necessarily useful. And so part of what you need to be able to do when you're starting to look at program analyses is ask yourself, how is this evaluated? Are the authors being honest or maybe just misleading, maybe unintentionally misleading? And how does that impact the usability or utility of these underlying techniques? It's very, very common for different techniques to be evaluated on simple cases that aren't realistic or to be evaluated using metrics that are unrealistic. And if you're not careful about recognizing those, then you might be misled and you might say, oh, this, this technique is great, I'll implement it, I'll spend a lot of time building up infrastructure for it, you try it out on a real program and it just fails. So you wanna be careful about this sort of thing. Okay, so how is this course gonna be organized? Well, the first few weeks, given the number of people, I'm gonna say the first two weeks are going to be just background and of lightning talks over these different uh, core areas and techniques inside program analysis. And this will be me presenting and you thinking about which papers you'd like to present and sending me an email as soon as you know so that you beat whoever else in the class also wants to present the same paper uh, so you get to present it. Okay, now I'm really upset kind of about the scheduling. Uh, I don't think that having a two hour, one hour system is very good. I don't know if that's the norm, um, but it's, it's not very pleasing to me, in part because for any one of these papers, I think we could easily discuss for an hour and a half. In fact, last time I taught a course like this, we had five students, which is a little more on the sketchy side, but we got it to go anyway, we didn't get canceled, um, and we talked for an hour and a half about every paper. There's a lot of material in here, and sometimes it takes that long to get past the superficial stuff and start digging into the critical analysis. So I'm not really sure how, how we're gonna handle this with just an hour, technically less than an hour, I guess, on, uh, on Thursdays and this kind of lopsidedness where we can't discuss part of a paper on one day. Um, it'll probably be the case that on Mondays, I'll give some sort of lightning talk, at least for the first few weeks, uh, describing a little bit more in depth how to apply some of the techniques that I go over superficially in the first two weeks. And then we'll have about an hour for each paper. 
Um, at least that's my thought process. We'll see what happens. It'll, uh, it's going to be fluid, so we'll, we'll change things up as they go along. Okay, so we're going to be reading foundational papers and new papers. Each of you will probably present two papers. Okay, so be prepared to actually present two papers. And again, you should tell me which papers you want to present before other people tell me they want to present the same paper. And we're going to have discussion. The presentation is meant to lead this critical discussion. And so on any week that you don't present a paper, you're going to critique one of the papers presented. And there are some guidelines for how to do this on the website. Uh, you'll want to send me the critiques the night before. Just like if you're presenting, you'll want to send me your slides the night before. So that I can go through them, I can make sure you've actually done them in advance and aren't just putting them off till right before the class, which does happen. Um, makes the presentations a little bit harder to get through uh, in terms of falling asleep. Anyway, yes. I'm also going to give you three small projects to introduce you to a, com a compilation infrastructure called LLVM. How many people have heard of LLVM? Okay, that's almost nobody. Um, I won't say that's a great thing, but that leaves you plenty of room to learn new stuff, which is good. Uh, these projects, the goal of them is to give you enough experience to do what you want for a final term project. That's the goal. So the first one, which is already released, is probably going to be a little bit painful because you've got to figure out how to set up the project, how to compile it, which alone, there are good instructions in the, the project template that I've made available to you, but it can be a little bit of a hassle. Um, I hope the next two projects will be easier. The focus is, again, learning LLVM so that you can do what you want for the term project. In terms of the presentations, there are guidelines on the website. In terms of our goals for them, help all of you learn what the material is. If there was confusion, we're going to have one person who's a dedicated expert for every paper, who's going to lead the rest of you and try to teach you what that material is, but also leading this critical discussion that I mentioned before. We want to perform this critical analysis of each technique. So showing how the technique behaves and show or lead discussion on where it might fail. Now notice what I'm saying here is show. In spite of the fact that these slides are all text, text is not the right way to, to give a presentation, right? It's just not very good. So show how the techniques work. Because if you just show slide after slide of text, like I'm doing right now, it's going to be boring, and nobody will like it, and everybody will fall asleep, especially with a two-hour course, no matter how much coffee you have. In terms of critiques, again, Guidelines on the website, mostly to prepare you for the discussion. Uh, there's a tech template on the website as well for creating the tech, the, the, the critiques. Should be straightforward. Uh, so you can look at things like, in particular, how these techniques might help your research that you're doing, or just any other sort of critical analysis will fall into this. Again, guidelines on the website. So what can we look at? Here's a laundry list. Uh, things like surviving failures, plagiarism detection, malware detection, identifying information links, automated debugging, automated test generation, automated regression testing, program guided fuzz testing, database explanation, battery use profiling, mobile privilege protection or reduction, reproducing remote bugs, program verification, the list goes on. Right? There, there's an infinite number of interesting problems with software you can actually look at. There is a, a link or, or list on the website of conferences with potentially interesting papers, I encourage you to go and look at them, find something you think might be interesting to you, and we can take a look at it in the class. Okay, so enough of this background boring stuff. We've got a survey set up, we can customize it for interest, blah, 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 okay. So that's the end of our introduction, good. And you're all mostly still awake and that's good too. So first things first, we wanna talk about program representations. So if we're going to talk about how to reason about programs and